Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Mass Retirees Weekly Update. Today's Friday, August 4th. I'm Sean Duhamel. Thank you so much for joining with us again this week. Now, I have two guests joining me. It's been a little while since we've done this, but let's mix it up a little bit. And I figure you're probably getting a little bit tired of seeing my face and hearing my voice exclusively on these, these weekly messages. So I've brought on our association's general counsel, Bill Reary, and our legislative liaison, Nancy McGovern, to help me with this week's message. We want to offer a little bit of a sneak preview or look behind the curtain with our upcoming September 2023 edition of The Voice, which, of course, is our bi-monthly newsletter that will be mailed to all Mass Retirees members starting, I believe, the week of August 14th. It should start to roll out. But before we jump into the details of the newsletter, let me just provide a quick update in terms of the state budget, which is the fiscal year 24, or FY24, as we call it. The House and the Senate um, approved the budget on Monday. They were able to hash out the final details of the conference committee report, which is a negotiation between the House and the Senate. This is part of the normal process that's existed now for many, many decades. Um, unfortunately, the budget is now a little bit more than a month um, overdue, um, but the end result is what counts. And most importantly for public retirees, particularly members of the state and teacher retirement systems, the budget does contain a 3% COLA on a $13,000 base. Um, this is what we anticipated happening. Now you will find a full report on the COLA in the newsletter, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, in addition to the COLA benefit, the budget also fully funds the state, the state share of the pension appropriation, which is extremely important. As you know, up until 1988, the state and the majority of cities and towns were not properly funding the retirement systems. And that's been one of the largest obstacles that we've had to overcome over the last several decades is getting out from under that unfunded liability that had built up. And part of that process of getting out from under that debt has been the ongoing dedication of the Commonwealth year after year to fully fund its share of the, the appropriation that goes to pay for um, state and teacher retirement benefits. And this year's appropriation is $4.1 billion, that's billion with a B. Uh, the budget also lays out the funding schedule for the state and teacher systems um, for the next two fiscal years as well. So for FY25 and FY26. So that's very important. And then beyond the pension funding, um, the budget also fully funds the state's group insurance commission, which if we go back um, not even that long ago, five or six years ago, the state was in a sort of in a bad habit, if you will, of not fully funding the GIC and relying at least in part on um, supplemental budgets or the deficiency budget at the end of the year, which at times led to some out-of-pocket pressures being put on retirees and active employees. Um, the legislature put a stop to that about four or five years ago, um, and they continued for FY24 with fully funding the GIC at nearly $3 billion. So between the pension appropriation and the GIC's appropriation, uh, the total cost to the Commonwealth is a little bit over $7 billion for FY24, which by anybody's um, estimation is a lot of money. So that's all good news. Now, the last thing about the COLA, state and teacher retirees can expect to get your COLA um, included in the August pension check that will come out at the end of this month. It will be retroactive back to July 1st in order to be eligible for the FY24 COLA. And this is a longstanding state law. It applies not only to state and teacher retirees, but also to municipal retirees. In order to be eligible for this year's COLA, you would have needed to have been retired prior to July 1st of 2022. So the law requires that you be retired for a full fiscal year, which always starts on July 1st, uh, prior to becoming eligible for the COLA. So with that, let me move into the report on the newsletter. As I said, it is now at the printer. Um, we are, every time when we wrap up the newsletter, we send it to the printer. Um, you could probably hear at, at, at your own home this collective sigh of relief that comes from uh, myself and our whole staff here at the association. Um, we put a tremendous amount of time and effort, blood, sweat, and tears into every edition of The Voice. 
It comes out six times a year. The next edition, uh, again, will be in your mailbox during the week of August 14th. We do all of the writing for the newsletter in-house. Um, everything that you see in that newsletter, by and large, is coming from us. And, and Nancy and Bill and I, um, Frank, Tom Bonarigo, we're all putting our, our efforts together. But it's primarily the three of us doing the lion's share of the writing. I have to give all the credit in the world to Bill. He is the editor-in-chief of The Voice. And he's the one that makes sure that we're going to meet our deadlines and everything comes together. Bill works very closely with our graphic design partners, our Chameleon Design Group, their Massachusetts-based company. Uh, Jim Crone and Jeff Jordan are the principals. They do a fantastic job for us. We have worked with them now for nearly 20 years. And the newsletter, I have it somewhere here, the new newsletter, amongst all the things on my desk. Um, here's what it looks like. You'll see on the front page and, and Jim and Jeff at Chameleon are the ones responsible for making this look so good. Um, and it's now at Standard Modern, which is a union based print shop here in Massachusetts. They're located down in the Fall River, New Bedford area. Um, they have been our print partners for quite some time. Um, but again, we do all of the work on this in house and one of the main roles of Bill, in addition to being the editor, is figuring out the placement of the articles. We want to make sure that um, every newsletter contains the most up-to-date information about your pension, about your health care, about the things that are going to be most important to you as a public retiree. And in many cases, the information that's contained in our publication and, and within the weekly updates, like you're watching right now, is news that you really can't find anywhere else. And that's something that makes our job here at Mass Retirees somewhat unique. And that's getting you um, unique information that you need to stay well informed, that there are no surprises in terms of anything related to your public retirement. And one of the key things for us is figuring out what's going on the front page. That's always sort of the, the biggest question. Um, issue after issue is what's gonna be up front. And it typically ends up being What's the, the hottest issue? What's the most important issue? Or, or what's an issue that's really going to impact our entire membership or at least the majority of our members? And this month, it contains some, some good news, some really good news, I think. As you saw or you read in last week's message, the first six months of 2023 have pro proven to be um, very productive, very good for our public pension system in terms of investments. Uh, the state PRIT fund is up more than 6.6% for the first six months of the year. Um, this is a tremendous rebound from what we saw back in 2022 when the systems on, on average lost a little bit over 11%. Why this is important is even though you're getting a defined benefit pension, which the amount of your pension is set based on your years of service and your age and your highest either three or five year average. Um, th th that's what makes up your base pension. But in terms of any additional benefits or the growth of the cost of living adjustment, that depends heavily on the success of our pension system. So if the system is doing well, if the system is making money, if we're paying down the unfunded liability, it makes it a lot easier for us as your advocates um, to successfully lobby and advocate on your behalf, whether it's at the state level or at the local level. And you have seen us or heard us say this over and over again in recent years. We believe that the success of our public pension systems must be shared with the retirees, shared with the beneficiaries who these systems exist um, for your benefits, your money. It deserves to be shared with you. So also on the front page is a story about the COLA improvements both at the local level in terms of the adoption of the additional 2% COLA during the past fiscal year. I'm happy to report that we now know of 81 of the 104 retirement systems approved and fully adopted the additional 2% COLA. You'll find a chart contained in this newsletter uh, listing all of the retirement systems. It lists the COLA base for each system, and it also indicates which retirement systems adopted the additional 2% COLA. And in, in addition to that, we also spell out which systems continue to lag behind and are not keeping up with taking care of their, their local retirees. But we also want to give credit to the systems that have, in recent years, um, decided to increase the COLA base, for instance, and shared the success of the system. 
Now, some of those systems that very recently increased the COLA base uh, made a conscious decision to focus on the base rather than adopting the additional 2% COLA. Um, every system is different. The financial um, implications on every system is going to be a little bit different. So um, this is not a one size fits all. In many cases, it, it really goes system by system. But overall, we are very pleased with the continued success of, of incrementally increasing these benefits. And we are making a full court press. Um, our full attention right now is finding a way to move forward with an increase of the state and teacher COLA base. And as I indicated over the past few weeks in our weekly message, uh, that means working closely with the legislative leadership, with the public service committee, with Governor Healy and her staff, um, with the state and teacher retirement boards, with PERAC and their actuaries to collectively find a way to affordably increase that COLA benefit on a more regular basis. Um, the hurdle that we have is not convincing anybody that this is a sound idea or, or a good idea. Everybody is in agreement that we need to continue to make improvements to the COLA benefit. Where we have the, the largest challenge is finding a way to be able to pay for that um, year over year going forward. And, and that's what's going to take some additional work, but I'm very confident that we're going to get there. Now, finally, on the front page, below the fold, as they say at the bottom of the page, is a story about the legislation that was filed on Capitol Hill by Massachusetts Congressman Richie Neal, who is the ranking member on the House Ways and Means Committee. Congressman Neal has refiled his, his legislation that would reform the windfall elimination provision. Um, what we have been, been doing in recent weeks, and Nancy and I had a meeting uh, about a month ago with Congressman Neal's staff, in addition to focusing on reform of the WEP, we believe and we have called on Congressman Neal to include a reform of the government pension offset, the GPO, which affects survivor um, or spousal social security benefits. We wholeheartedly believe that that must be part of any reform legislation, whether it's moving forward or it's been filed in concept. Now is the time for us to figure out how we're going to be able to fix not only the WEP, but also the GPO at the same time. Now, this uh, article, in addition to reporting on Congressman Neal's legislation, talks about the, the Republican approach. Uh, the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee is Congressman Jason Smith. He is from Missouri. He is new to this role. He is a self-proclaimed fiscal conservative. But it's our understanding, um, speaking with Congressman Neal's staff, as well as some of the folks that we're working with in Washington, um, that Chairman Smith does support a reform of at least the WEP, hopefully the GPO as well. Um, but he, from what we have just learned over the past couple of days, um, Congressman Smith is only interested in moving forward with WEP or GPO legislation that he deems to be viable. They're not going to vote on something and move a bill forward just to see it die in the U.S. Senate. And we talk about the political ramifications of this within the newsletter. We also talk a little bit about some of the other bills that have been filed relative to weapon GPO, uh, the so-called full repeal legislation. And taking it one step further, as we were about to go to press with the newsletter last week, it came to our attention that some of the national um, fiscal watchdog groups that are very focused on balancing the federal budget and a fiscally responsible um, you know, federal debt ceiling and so forth um, have recently come out vocally opposed to full repeal of weapon GPO. So we have included some of that information in the newsletter. We often get questions, you know, <laughs> who is opposed to weapon GPO repeal and why? Well, we spell that out in the newsletter um, and that will help explain a little bit about our ongoing position of focusing on reform of weapon GPO, which we believe has a viable path forward rather than the ideological standpoint of full repeal and nothing but full repeal. As much as we would like to see weapon GPO fully repealed, we do not believe that there is a viable or realistic path forward to get that done. Um, unfortunately, th that's the reality that we're facing right now. Hopefully at some point in the future that might change. But as of today, 
Um, we don't believe that there is a viable path forward for full repeal, but we do believe that there is a viable path forward for reform of both WEP and GPO. Now, one last point before I turn it over to Nancy and Bill to talk a little bit about the articles that they focused on. On page three of the newsletter, you'll find a full calendar of upcoming mass retirees events through the fall of 2023. We have five area meetings coming up, including our annual meeting taking place on September 22nd. It will be held in Mansfield this year. Please, if, if you are interested in attending the annual meeting on the 22nd, please pay very close attention um, to the, the change of venue and the new address where we had been holding the area meeting in the past in Randolph, first at Lantana, and then more, more recently at Lombardo's. Um, those facilities are now closed or are in the process of closing, and that forced us to have to change venues uh, to a no, new location, which is unfortunate because that was an ideal location. Um, but we're very excited. Um, hopefully, we're going to have a great crowd this year as we're emerging out of the pandemic. Um, we saw throughout the spring an increase in the attendance at our local meetings. Um, as you've heard me say before, one of the my favorite parts of this position is being able to meet with you face to face. And I know that Bill and Nancy and Frank Valeri, our whole team, feel the same way. So um, if you have been to an area meeting before, please come back. If we're going to be in your neck of the woods, um, come say hello. If you're new to mass retirees or you haven't been to an area meeting, come on by, say hello. It'd be great to see you in person and, and, and be able to meet with you. Our, our meetings tend to last about 90 minutes, give or take, from about 11 a.m. to 12.30 or so, quarter one with Q&A. Um, it also gives us the opportunity to answer your questions or you know, help you with any retirement-related problems that you might be having that you might feel more comfortable speaking with one of us face-to-face -face rather than over the phone or through email. In addition to our five in-person area meetings, we are also holding another virtual Teletown Hall event that will be on Friday, September 29th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Our special guest will be the Executive Director and Chief Investment Officer of the PRIM Board, Michael Trotsky. Um, Bill will be talking a little bit about a, an article on Michael that we have done in this newsletter. Um, this meeting will be very informative. Again, it's on um, Friday, September 29th at 1 p.m. So if you have um, the availability of the, that afternoon, all you need to do is answer your phone at one o'clock. If we have your number on file, um, you're automatically connected to the meeting and our virtual teletown halls last maybe an hour or so. We, we try to keep things um, condensed as best we can. No one wants to listen to us babble on for more than an hour. Um, the other way to connect to our virtual meetings is that the toll-free number is printed on the back of your mass retirees membership card. So in addition to our office telephone number and our personal contact information, you also have our news hotline, toll-free number, and the Teletown Hall member on the back of your membership card. So the, there are the various ways that you can get involved, be engaged with us, and again, hopefully you can attend one or more events uh, going forward. But let me turn it over now um, First of all, to Nancy, because she has a big legislative update. We've had a lot of activity on Beacon Hill over the past um, couple of months of moving our, our legislative package forward. Um, but I'll let her and Bill talk a little bit about um, what they uh, have worked on in this edition. Nancy? Thanks, Sean. Um, first off, as Sean said, uh, there is a legislative update article uh, in this edition. Um, after a bit of a slow hearing, uh, start for the legislature. The uh, Joint Committee on Public Service um, scheduled a number of hearings, both um, towards the end of May, in June, and in July. In over those um, couple months, we ended up having the majority of our legislation heard. Um, there was a meeting, there was a hearing held on the 13th and the 29th as well as the 25th of July. Um, <clears throat> so during those hearings, and the article goes into the pieces of legislation that were heard uh, during each of those hearings, but uh, we participated uh, in person, uh, which was the first time in a long time since 2020 that we were able to kind of 
get back in front of the committee and uh, offer public testimony. Uh, the first hearing on June 13th, uh, myself and Sean testified. Um, the hearing on the 29th of June, um, President Frank Valeri and our legislative chairman, Tom Bonarigo, uh, held down the fort and testified before the committee on our COLA legislation. And then on the 25th of July, um, I testified along with uh, Sean and Tom on several of other pieces of legislation that we um, had before the committee. So currently we have about four pieces that still need to be scheduled for a public hearing. We're anticipating those occurring uh, sometime in the early fall. Um, and then we will look to the committee to hold some executive sessions so that we can get some additional movement on the legislation. So the article covers the bills um, and next steps uh, moving forward on the legislative front. Uh, another piece uh, that is in the, the bulletin for this uh, September is covers the GIC enrollment. So uh, at the June GIC commission meeting, the commissioners heard from uh, executive director Matt Vino and his staff on the results of the open enrollment for new plan uh, design and changes uh, for this coming fiscal year. So the open enrollment began on April 5th. It concluded on May 3rd. Um, after a year long procurement process that was completed in uh, the early spring. And uh, they presented all of the data. Uh, the article goes into full detail about the amount of uh, plan membership transfers um, across plans. As we have been reporting, uh, there was a, a number of plan changes, uh, in particular on the non-Medicare side, uh, those living outside of New England are now in the uh, Harvard Access America plan. Um, on the Medicare side, we had um, the Unicare OME plan becoming the Medicare Extension Plan, um, where they merged and did away with the non-CIC option for uh, the Medicare plan. And so they considered that in, as a transfer into moving a new plan. Um, so you will be able to see from the numbers that were uh, presented at the, the commission meeting to the commissioners that there was significant activity. Um, and as you folks know that had to engage with either us or the GIC um, through that process that the staff over uh, at the GIC did Yeoman's work during uh, this open enrollment. Um, we presented the numbers of phone calls and emails um, and online portal uh, information that the GIC fielded uh, during that uh, five week period. So those two articles cover some of the big uh, pieces for health insurance and our legislative package uh, over the last couple months. And I think and Bill? Did we lose you, Bill? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> I thought, I, uh, I thought we had a technical glitch here. <laughs> We're performing without a net, folks. So <laughs> there's a dead air that they don't like on radio, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to take this a few minutes to talk about some of the other stories, uh, articles that are in, in the September bulletin. Um, before I do that, I just want to point out that we're already working on the November voice, uh, putting together our uh, whiteboard of different su subjects that we'd like to, to bring up in the next bulletin. Um, and that'll grow. Um, but I, I bring it up because if you have any ideas out there as to subjects that we should cover, issues that should be covered, please, you know, either email or call, call me or Sean or Nancy and let us know uh, what you were thinking of. Uh, we, we, it's a collaborative effort and that goes beyond just 
uh, us here in the office. It goes and it goes to you people, our members. Um, we we as Sean pointed out earlier, uh, the, the one thing that we one thing that I like and that he pointed out what uh, in connection with in person meetings is getting that in getting together with our members and interacting. And sometimes things come up in those meetings and we said, I better jot that down and take it back and see maybe, maybe we should look more into this. So again, if, if you think of it, if you're thinking of something, uh, just let us know and, and we can go from there. Um, but in terms of the September bulletin, Nancy already talked a little bit about um, the GIC and the open enrollment. Um, it's interesting that with that open enrollment, um, one of the numbers that came out is that the GIC uh, had over 38,500 engagements with its portal. That's something that we've discussed uh, and asked our members to think about joining. Uh, that's called the My GIC link. And we have an update on that in this bulletin. Um, and just what we're telling, reminding our members, our readers, that maybe this is a good, this is a very good thing. It is, it might be, it is a very good thing. Um, and maybe you should think about participating in it and, and registering with the My, My GIC link uh, portal that the that's run by the GIC. The other thing though, that, that we also uh, wrote about in the September bulletin and relating to the GIC, is about the, uh, the the hearing aid benefit. I think this is great. Um, uh, beginning this Jan July one, um, the G uh, the benefit, the hearing aid benefit, for all intents and purposes, doubled. Um, uh, before July one, in most cases, it was seventeen hundred dollars for both ears over two years. Now the new benefit. Uh, beginning J July 1, over all the Medicare plans, that's the four Medicare subplans offered by the GIC, as well as its Medicare Advantage plan, will be providing a benefit of $1,700 per year for every two years. So that, that's a great benefit. So um, I know we all get to that age when we may need a little bit of help. And it certainly helps uh, that the uh, the benefit for the hearing aid has gone up by that particular by that amount. Um, one of the other things that we, we try to do with the bulletin is um, keep our members updated on issues that we've been following. Um, one of those is uh, at the federal level was which is the Inflation Reduction Act, IRA as I call it. IRA all included uh, some important. Uh, prescription drug benefits uh, and changes uh, uh, in connection with the Medicare law. Um, one of them being, and maybe some of you have enjoyed this benefit, is that the insulin now is just uh, they. Th if you're on a Medicare plan, a Medicare prescription drug plan, they the the maximum amount that you can be charged for the insulin um, is thirty five dollars, and for most vaccinations, it's free if you're on a Medicare sub plan. But as we advise in the story, it's important for you to check with your carrier because it's got to be on your prescription drug list. So remember that, please. And we emphasize that in this story. But the other part of this story that we're, we're still monitoring very closely is now that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, can now negotiate with the drug manufacturers over drug prices, not all of them, because it's going to start out very, very in, a, in increments. And the first thing that they're going to be doing, uh, the CMS, is selecting the 10 drugs, prescription drugs, that will be part of the first negotiations with the drug manufacturers. Uh, CMS is, is to release that list um, this month. Uh, it's supposed to be out by September 1. And unfortunately, you know, they hadn't released it before we went to press, but we'll be watching that closely. And like we always tell you, when there's evolving issues like this, we'll keep you updated, um, not only in the voice, in the November voice, but we will also be updating you on these issues like the uh, 
uh, drug uh, negotiations um, on our web on our website and in our weekly messages and Sean's weekly videos. So we'll, we'll, we'll keep on top of that. But as again, that's part of what we do with the bulletin. We try to keep going. We keep monitoring issues, making sure where they're headed and keep you informed. That's important to keep our members informed. And that's also true with the update that we have in, in the uh, September bulletin on IBIS. Um, I, I would hope if you're uh, an avid reader of our bulletin that you know what, we're ta uh, what I'm talking about when I say IBIS. Um, it's, it's the tele telehealth services program uh, that is free for our members who are enrolled in Medicare and have certain conditions. Um, now, they've expanded that uh, with the help of MIA, the Massachusetts Insurance Interlocal Insurance Association, MIA. They've expanded it to the local level, but they're doing it uh, by going into each community. And you'll see in the, in the uh, September bulletin, an example of where that outreach has taken place uh, uh, between IBIS and Maya in connection with the town of Maynard. And that'll continue to go on and you'll see more updates on that um, in, in uh, upcoming bulletins. Now, the last thing that I was just gonna touch upon, Sean brought this up in terms of the uh, MACRIS. Now, MACRIS is the association for the 104 retirement systems. That's the 102 local systems plus the state and teachers. Now, the thing with, with is that you know and we know that some of these issues that we've been talking about, particularly with the COLA and COLA base increases and the 5% uh, COLA for fiscal year 23, they couldn't be done um, without the help of, of the local retirement boards. And so we keep it, we have a very solid relationship with the local retirement boards and with MACRIS. So when they hold their convention, they ask us to come in and participate in their in their conferences. And in this particular conference that was held in June, uh, both our legislative chairman, Tom Bonarigo, and Nancy, as our legislative liaison, took part in the legislative panel that was being conducted at the MACRIS meeting. But in addition to that, uh, we have a lot of good friends who uh, are, were also speaking at this conference. And I'm referring to uh, the executive director of PARAC, uh, John Parsons, um, and uh, the executive director and CIO of the uh, PRIM, uh, Mike Trotsky. Um, obviously, uh, John's, uh, John Parsons' remarks were more in connection with the work of, of uh, their work, which is in, in the pension area, while um, uh, Mike Trotsky, uh, Director Trotsky's remarks were more addressed to the issue of the funding. And I think one important, one important highlight um, that um, Mike Trotsky, among, the, among many uh, positive developments that he, 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 had, he pointed out during his presentation at MACRIS, is that the, over the last 10 years, um, the assets of PRIT, of PRIT have doubled to approximately 90, Five uh, billion dollars, ninety-five billion with a B dollars. Um, this is all important, uh, as you know from reading our uh, uh, earlier bulletins and uh, and listening to the weekly messages. That we need that success of those of of Prim and of the local retirement boards when it comes to their investment returns. We need that success in order to get our members better benefits. So with that, Sean, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Make sure I'm unmuted. <laughs> so, thank you, Bill. And, you know, from from what you can tell from from what Nancy and, and Bill just said, and you know, we have quite a bit of content in the newsletter. We typically range, you know, anywhere from 15 to 18, 19 articles, depending on, you know, how lengthy they are. We do have some, you know, rather large reports in here, whether it be the COLA or the information on. Um, Social Security, certainly, you know, just there's a lot of moving parts there. So we want it to be as comprehensive as we can. Uh, we also try to you know, include you know, photos and, and other um, you know, graphics to try to help tell the story. So whether it's photos of our area meetings, just to give you a sense of what to expect. If you haven't been to our meetings, you know, highlights some of our guests. 
Uh, one of our meetings um, this past spring, we were very pleasantly surprised to see uh, the Unicare General Manager, David Morales, suddenly appear in the back of the room um, unannounced and unexpected. He stayed for probably about two thirds of the meeting, just standing in the back of the room. Um, another guest we had this past winter down in Florida, and you'll see her on in this newsletter, um, is Sue Tiffany, who just recently retired from Unicare um, after 46 years with the company. Uh, she started way back when, when Unicare was still John Hancock. Um, she has been an integral part of the Unicare team and the Hancock team, working directly with the GIC, taking very good care of our members, uh, working hand in hand with our insurance coordinator, Cheryl Stillman, um, to help address any problems or questions that have arisen um, over the past four decades. And it's an incredible amount of time. Um, I know I've, I've been here now at Mass Retirees. This is my 29th year, which I think is a long time. Um, and when you look at someone like Sue, who has you know nearly doubled that, it's incredible. So um, we wanted to give credit where it's due. Sue, if you're watching this, congratulations once again on your retirement. Uh, Frank and I had the opportunity to see Sue at, at a little bit of a going away party um, earlier this summer, and Sue will certainly be missed. And you know the the dedication, whether it's from the Unicare folks or from our friends at Blue Cross. Um, our friends at IBIS that we're working hand in hand with. And we have a lot of good partners out there, whether they're in government or out of government. You know, these are people who take their jobs very seriously. Um, it's more than a job. It's really a calling uh, for many of these individuals that, that they want to be in a position that they're helping people and that they're serving uh, public retirees. And we are extremely grateful for that. So um, with that, we're going to wrap up for today. This is one of our, I think, longer um, videos, but I, I hope that you've gotten a lot out of this. Um, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to give a little bit of a preview of some of the things um, coming up when the legislature as well as Congress return from their August recess. As I said earlier, we have a full calendar of local area meetings throughout the fall. So again, hopefully um, you can take the time to come and say hello. It'd be great to see you in person. Uh, I hope you are enjoying your summer um, and we will go from there. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.